welcome back. Um, yeah, I also just want to encourage everyone to um, to go to the TA sessions. Um, I think it's really, you know, it's really good to like these, um, these sort of problem sets there. Some of the problems are, are really to sort of reinforce or some of the discussion topics are to sort of reinforce the material lecture and some are to go a little bit further. And even if you haven't started the problem sets or you have lots of questions or you want to work on a previous problem set, um, you're very much encouraged to go to the um, to the, the TA sessions and the TAs are very happy to um, to talk not only about the most recent problem sets, but previous ones or answer any um, any questions. So, um, okay, so let me uh, let me set up the screen share. Um, Um, okay, so yeah, so I want to sort of pick up from from last week. So um, right, so last week, or towards the end of last week, um, we uh, right, so we introduced in the field of piadic numbers. Uh, so this was. Uh, suitable completion of, of the rational numbers uh, with respect to the piadic absolute value. Um, and right, so I guess we discussed a proof of, um, or we discussed Hensel's lemma that uh, gives a criterion for when you can solve equations in the piadic numbers. Um, and uh, at least for p greater than two, uh, we discussed the classification. Uh, of quadratic forms. Over QP, and so let me let me just recap how that how that went. So, um, so the main result was, uh, well, so you can you can state it in terms of bit rings, for example. So it's a classification of anisotropic quadratic forms over QP when P is greater than two, and the statement is that the the bit group. So well, let's say the bit group of QP is isomorphic to two copies of uh, the bit group of FP. So in other words, an anisotropic quadratic form over QP is a sort of equivalent data as a pair of anisotropic forms over, over FP. And so specifically, uh, right, so where does, how does this correspondence come about? Um, well, if you have an anisotropic quadratic form over QP, well, you can write it in diagonal form and then you can assume that it's, uh, so you can assume it's, it looks like say U1 through UR comma PV1 through P, Vs, where the uis and the vjs are in zp cross. So um, by sort of multiplying by even powers of p, you can always sort of move the diagonal entries so their piadic valuation is either zero, so their piadic units, or one, so it's p times a piadic unit. And uh, so the class of this is going to go to uh, the class of u1 bar, us, uh, sorry, U, ur bar, so you sort of reduce mod p. Uh, and then V1 bar through Vs bar, right? So, okay, so, so, um, so if you have a quadratic form over QP, what you can always do is you can, you know, you can diagonalize it and then you can put the entries so that they have piadic valuations zero or one. And then you sort of reduce it mod P, reduce the ones that are piadic units mod P, and then you reduce the ones, so if you have the ones that are P times piadic units, you divide by P and then reduce those mod P. Um, and so this gives a correspondence between anisotropic quadratic forms over QP and pairs of anisotropic quadratic forms over FP um, for, for P greater than two. So let me just write that again. Um, and yeah, so this is, um, well, this is a special case of a theorem of Springer. Um, and so this was, this was really proved using Hensel's lemma and you needed Hensel's lemma because somehow you're, you're taking square roots. Um, and uh, well, it's easier to take square roots when, when um, in QP for, for, yeah, so thanks. So, right, so where did we use P, P is greater than two? Well, we use P is greater than two. So the fact that this is even well-defined, so it's not obvious that something like this is even well-defined, first of all, uh, because, you know, you can, there are many different ways you can write a quadratic form in, in diagonal form. And uh, so it's not obvious that this kind of construction is even well-defined to begin with. And I guess, in fact, the way we really constructed it was more as a map from right to left that if you have a quadratic form over FP, then you sort of lift it to a quadratic form over ZP uh, and then QP. And, 
And so that you could see was sort of well-defined by really by using Hansel Sama, because uh, um, so, so, so for example, you're, you're really using the structures of, of, of squares, right? So maybe I should write this. So this really used the structure of squares in QP. So in particular, so we use the fact that any element, let's call it X, which is congruent to one mod P is a square in QP say in ZP. Um, and so that's gonna imply that the map from right to left, which is I guess maybe the most more natural way of actually defining the map is, is well-defined. Um, right, so this is again, so this is for P greater than two. Um, Right. So this, uh, right. So this gave a pretty sort of concrete, uh, but yeah. So the conclusion was that you have a pretty concrete sort of parameter, parameterization of uh, anisotropic quadratic forms over QP, and in particular, a corollary is that any anisotropic form uh, over QP, again P greater than two, uh, has dimension less than or equal to four. Right, because, because we know that any anisotropic quadratic form over FP has uh, dimension at most two. Any three-dimensional form over, 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 Q, over FP is, uh, is isotropic. So that was a, oh, yeah, so that was a little bit of a recap from, um, from Friday. Um, and the first thing, yeah, the first thing I wanted to do today was to try to sort of revisit this, um, um, this type of statement. And in particular, I mean, this is really for QP for P greater than two. But uh, in fact, there is, there is sort of a, so th this particular statement isn't quite going to work in, in characteristic two, or sorry, for, for P equals two. Uh, for example, we haven't even defined uh, the, vit, the vit ring of F2. We've only considered vit rings in um, an odd characteristic or zero characteristic. Um, but in fact, there is sort of a uniform, a somewhat uniform description of the vit ring of, of QP that works even when P is equal to two. Uh, well, at least sort of modulo a filtration. And in fact, it doesn't just work for QP. Uh, it, it also works for any local, any local non-Archimedean field. So I mean, the first goal today is uh, so to describe the vit ring of QP in a more uniform way. Sorry, so, uh, yes, yes, thanks. So, so in the question, right, so um, yeah, so let me write it this way. So in other words, the U invariant of QP is at most four. Well, actually it's equal to four. It's equal to four because you, you do have an anisotropic quadratic form over, over FP, and then you can lift that, and then you can you know, multi add that to P times itself. And so, so by this you get, yeah. Okay, right. Um, right, so and I guess another thing that you can say is that there are exactly um, there are exactly sixteen isomorphism classes of anisotropic quadratic forms over QP for P greater than two, because the vit the vit uh, vit group of FP has cardinality four. I guess that whoops, that was something um, right, that we saw, we saw earlier. Um, okay, so so first is also I want to say something about um, you know like the p-adic numbers in general and um, um, right. So um, yeah. So in fact, it's not it's not just going to work for for the fields of p-adic numbers, but it's going to work for any any local field. Um, so I want to make the following definition. So definition: a local field is a, a field E with an absolute value, so with a non-trivial absolute value, well, up to equivalence, right? So we said that two absolute values are the same or equivalent if they give you the same topology or if one is a power of the other, um, right? And, and, and such that uh, E is locally compact. 
uh, for the induced topology. So as a metric space, it's, um, it's locally compact. And so in particular, it's complete. Um, right, so for example, we've, we've seen that, uh, that QP is an example of a local field. So I think this was on the, uh, this was on one of the problem sets. So if you take the, the unit ball or the unit disk, so that's the piadic integers in QP, that's a compact space. Um, and well, also the real numbers is a local field. Uh, well, again, the real numbers are locally compact and similarly for the complex numbers. Um, right, but so in fact, there's a classification of local fields. So um, essentially there, there are three different types of local fields. So, uh, Right, so let E be a local field. So the first statement is that if E is Archimedean, so, you, so, so if you have a local field, it comes with an absolute value. And you can ask if that's Archimedean or non-Archimedean. So Archimedean, so non-Archimedean, meaning that you have the stronger absolute value of X plus Y is at most the maximum, of the absolute value of X and the absolute value of Y. And Archimedean, the condition that that is, well, that's not true. So if E is Archimedean, then E is isomorphic to the real numbers or the complex numbers. So that's sort of a first type of local field. Uh, yes, isomorphic as a topological field or as a field with an absolute value, with, which is defined up to equivalence. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so if you have an Archimedean local field, then it's, it's the real numbers or it's the complex numbers. So that's, Great. Um, and then second is the case if E has positive characteristic. So, so if uh, then E is isomorphic to the field of Laurent series over a finite field. So, uh, so another way that you can cook up a local field is that you take a finite field and then consider all Laurent series over that field. Um, and so the field of Laurent series over a finite field, well, it has, uh, it has, a, it has, a, value, it has a natural absolute value, which is a T attic absolute value. Where instead of where well, I mean right so where you look at uh, so so the valuation or the absolute value of, of something is going to be in terms of uh, how many powers of t divided or what sort of the order of the zero or pole of this uh, Laurent series at uh, at t equals zero um, and right so that's going to give you that's going to give you an, an absolute value and in fact it's it's a local field um, so for example uh, if you're in a situation like this in the unit disk the elements of uh, norm at most one is given by FQ double brackets T, the ring of formal power series over FQ double brackets T. And that is given the T-adic topology. So that's given, uh, but if you think about it just as a topological space, it's a, it's a product of copies of FQ. So as a topological space, the unit disk looks like a product of copies of FQ a countable product of copies of FQ, and that's that's compact. Well, I guess it's a special case of Tikhonov theorem. It's a, it's a product of finite sets, um, but in fact, it's a countable product, so it's really sort of maybe a more explicit case of uh, Tikhonov theorem. Okay, so then this is this is a case of positive characteristic, and uh, right, and then finally, there's the case of uh, of characteristic zero, but but non Archimedean. Um, so if the characteristic of E is equal to zero but E is non-Archimedean, then E is a finite extension of QP, of some QP. So, 
So, uh, so the p-adic numbers are an example of the local field, but in fact, if you have any finite extension of the p-adic numbers, any finite field extension. Um, so for example, you could take something like qp and uh, add a square root of p uh, or add a pth root of unity or something, and you're gonna get some sort of finite extension of qp. And then it's a basic theorem that you can always extend the absolute value. So first of all, it's, an, it's a basic theorem that you can always extend the absolute value to this finite extension, and it's gonna become an example of a local field. So for example, I mean, there's essentially, there's gonna be a unique way of extending the absolute value. So the absolute value of the square root of p, for example, is gonna be well, the square root of the absolute value of p. Um, and, uh, and then it's going to, right, so it's gonna be a local field. Um, oh, sorry, so there's a question. Uh, isn't there, with respect to what you just said, just to, uh, to to see whether like this stems from a general theorem, isn't there a general result that says about this extension of the, the absolute value that if I have a, an algebraic extension of a complete field, which has mm -hmm. some absolute value, then I can uniquely extend it. I think it's like cruel extension right. theorem, well, right? So or not exactly sure who, what, well, it, that's true. That's correct. So if you, if you have a, if you have a complete field and you have an algebraic or a finite extension, you can always, um, there's a unique way of extending the absolute value. Okay. Thanks. So it, it's not unique if it's not complete, but you can always do it. But if it's complete, then yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so, right. So I, I guess I wanted to kind of, you know, sort of say this explicitly for a couple of reasons. One is uh, that some of these results are gonna really work uniformly for local fields. So not just for QP. And so it's good to sort of state them in this generality. Uh, but also, like if you if you haven't seen QP before, then maybe this sort of also helps to sort of orient uh, um, orient yourself because the idea is that uh, uh, if you look at if you look at cases two and three, the idea is that QP you should think of QP as sort of analogous to the field of formal uh, formal Laurent series over a finite field, um, and um, so. In general, questions involving you know various most types of questions, you expect them to be um, sort of easier for, for formal Laurent series than for QP. So QP, you think of it as sort of a maybe slightly more difficult version of formal Laurent series. Um, and for example, it's more difficult because well, if you think about p-adic numbers, right? I mean, so you sort of informally a p-adic number is something like a formal Laurent series in the variable p. Um, but when you add p-adic numbers, you have to carry. Uh, there's some sort of carrying involved, whereas if you add formal Laurent series in the variable t, there's no carrying involved. So, so informally, qp is like fp Laurent series t, the field of formal Laurent series in a variable t, except the variable, the quote unquote variable, is p. And uh, Somehow, when you add and multiply, the, the rules for adding and multiplying is going to be a little bit more are going to be a little bit more complicated. I mean, in practice, it's probably best not to think of QP as literally sort of Laurent series in, in P. This is really more of an analogy. I mean, really, you build QP using this completion procedure, but it, there's just sort of an analogy. Okay, so what I what I wanted to do is to try to describe uh, the vit ring of um, so in general there's sort of a description of the vit ring of any local field, or at least a, a description up to um, uh, sort of associated gradients, uh, associated graded terms, um, and uh, yeah, so I wanted to sort of explain that. So in general, there is a pretty explicit. Um, but to to explain this, we need to introduce one more uh, one more ingredient, which is which is called the Hilbert symbol. So this use this is going to use uh, this is going to use an ingredient called a Hilbert symbol. So 
so I guess my um, my next goal is to sort of um, yeah sort of explain that. But maybe let me let me sort of state one of the the main. Um, so so maybe let me let me start by sort of stating like one of the main uh, sort of outputs of um, of this classification. So theorem. So let E be a local field. And so first of all, I should say that if E is the real numbers or the complex numbers, we already, you know, we saw sort of really in the first lecture what quadratic forms look like. So let's say E uh, is a non-Archimedean local field. Um, and let me assume E has characteristic uh, greater than uh, not two. Right, so this, so, so Q2 is okay, Q2 is characteristic zero, but I, I don't wanna consider F2 Laurent series T because we're, you know, we haven't really talked about quadratic forms in characteristic two. Um, so then what is always gonna be true is that any quadratic form in at least five variables is isotropic. And there exists uh, a unique anisotropic form of uh, dimension four. Okay. So in particular, the U invariant is gonna be equal to four. Okay, so, um, so with this in mind, I wanna to try to say something about the Vit ring of E. So goal is to say something of the field E. And uh, right, so in general, if F is any field, we can consider the uh, we can consider the Vit ring of F. Sorry. So this is the ring of all isomorphism classes of quadratic forms modulo the hyperbolic forms. And uh, the Vit ring of F has, has an ideal, so it has a natural ideal sitting inside it, which is the ideal of, uh, of forms of even dimension. So I is additively generated. By the forms, uh, well, I'm going to call them the forms brackets one minus a as a ranges over the elements of F cross. So just for, sort of for re reasons of normalization, I'm going to, I'm going to put in a minus sign here. Um, and this, this ideal I is, is additively generated by these, by these two dimensional forms. Um, because if you have any two-dimensional form, you can write it as sort of a difference of these things. Um, or, well, if you have any even-dimensional form, you can write it as a sum with signs of, of these things. Um, okay. So, um, right, so, so, so you always have this ideal. This is sometimes called the, the fundamental ideal. And, um, right, so uh, moreover, what you can do is uh, you can describe um, you can describe, so here, here's a basic fact about this ideal, which is that there is an isomorphism which is that I mod I squared uh, is isomorphic to F cross modulo F cross squared. So that, uh, so if you take I modulo I squared, then it's isomorphic to 
uh, to the non-zero elements in F modulo the squares in F. And this isomorphism is coming from the signed uh, sign determinant, or, or, the, or what I, I guess what I, uh, or the, the discriminant. Right, so sorry, so there's a question, how do we know that over E we can always represent one? Um, so we can't, I mean, I guess the statement is that if you have, right, so I mean, if you have some form brackets, you know, B comma C, then you're supposed to write that as a diff, as a, um, right, so, so, so sorry, so this is, this is saying that as, a, as an abelian group, it's generated by, brackets one minus brackets a. Um, so this is also in the vit ring, this is the same thing as, as one, one minus the class of brackets a. And so if you have, if you have some even form, which is like a comma b, uh, or brackets a minus brackets b, you can write that as a difference of, of these, times, these types of elements. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so explicitly this, this isomorphism sends the class of an even dimensional form let's say v comma q well it's going to go to uh, it's going to go to the determinant of v but it's really going to be up to a sign so it's going to be minus 1 to the dimension over 2 times the determinant of v And the claim is that this, this induces an isomorphism uh, between i mod i squared and the units mod, uh, mod the square of the units. So yeah, so the reason for these signs basically is that the, um, is that you're working with a vit ring instead of the Grotendieck vit ring. So, so, so the vit ring is uh, you're, you're taking all quadratic forms, but you're allowed to add on a hyperbolic form and a hyperbolic form is, 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 is not gonna change anything. So the hyperbolic form has determinant one, but it has dimension two. And sort of because of that normalization, because if you add on a hyperbolic form, you'll change things, you'll change the determinant by a sign, but you'll change the dimension by two. Um, you define the sort of signed, uh, signed determinant or also called a discriminant. And it's, it's, it's well-defined on the ideal of, of even dimensional forms in um, in, in the vit ring of F. So, so, this, so this is a map called a discriminant, which goes from I to F cross mod F cross squared. And now I squared, the square of this ideal I is generated uh, by products of elements in I. So it's generated by things of the form one uh, brackets one minus a minus b a b, and these classes have discriminant one. Um, so it actually factors. Over a map which goes from i mod i squared to f cross mod f cross squared. And then one, one checks that that's an isomorphism. And so the map in the other direction is, uh, right, so the map in the other direction, which goes from f cross mod f cross squared into here is sending a to brackets one minus a. So this is something that's true for any field. For any field, uh, for any field, this augmentation ideal modulo i squared is automatically isomorphic to f cross mod f cross squared. Right. So, so let me just sort of recap that by saying the general facts. So for any field f, the idea is to consider 
the augmentation ideal i sitting inside the vit ring w of f and uh, the iatic filtration. So and the sequence of powers of this ideal i. So you have the vit ring of f that contains the ideal i and that contains the square of the ideal and so on and so forth. So you have this you have the sort of descending filtration uh, of, of the bit rank. And you always have, for any field F, you always have the formula that I mod I squared is isomorphic to F cross mod F cross squared. Well, first I should say that W of F mod I, well, I is the ideal of even dimensional forms. So W of F mod I is Z mod two. And I mod I squared is F cross mod F cross squared. So now I want to explain what this sort of gives you if, if you have a local field. So for a local field, um, in fact, you have the formula that uh, this filtration is actually finite. So for a general field, this filtration might be infinite, but for a local field, what you always have is that I cubed is equal to zero. So for a local field, let's call it E, you always have that the cube of the augmentational ideal is zero. So this is, I guess, closely, I mean, this is sort of coming from the fact that five dimensional quadratic forms are automatically isotropic. So this is coming from the U invariant. The U invariant of E is at most, well, it's equal to four. Um, and uh, in fact, um, and in fact, I I squared mod I cubed uh, is 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 a is a Z mod two. So for E a local field. When we, we have this finite iatic filtration on the vit ring, and the associated graded terms. So in general, if you have an ideal, I mean, if you have an ideal in some commutative ring, you can, I mean, you can look at the the terms of i to the n mod i to the n plus one, um, right? So you have w of w of e containing the ideal i containing the ideal i squared, and then containing zero. So i squared here is equal to z mod two. Um, the, vit, the, the vit ring of e modulo i is also equal to z mod two. And i mod i squared uh, is equal to e cross mod e cross squared. So there's this description, if you have any local field, so there's not, sorry. Right, so, sorry, so there's a question, which is, do we already know that local fields have U invariant four? Um, so no, I have not proved that yet. So what, what we've proved is, we've proved that for QP. So yeah, so thanks. So, so just, just to be clear about the logic here, I, I guess I'm not probably gonna be able to prove everything in this lecture, um, but I, I just want to describe, so what I'm, what I'm gonna explain is gonna be stuff that we've sort of entirely proved for, for QP for P greater than two. And I wanna sort of try to explain how this, so we haven't proved it for Q2, but it's not actually too hard to prove it for Q2. So for Q2, yeah, right. So, so for Q2, this is kind of, um, Right, sorry, I, I think I should have um, explained this earlier. So, so, so for Q2, I think I, I will put this on the problem set. Um, yeah, so just to, just to back up a little bit. So yeah, sorry for the, for the mess. So, so for Q2, um, I, I guess I, I wanna sort of put this on the, on the problem set. Um, and so it's, it's fun to actually work, work all of this out pretty explicitly. So can show directly that every five dimensional form is isotropic and uh, 
that any anisotropic four-dimensional form uh, is isomorphic to the following. It's brackets one minus five, two minus 10. So, so for QP for P greater than two, you can work this out sort of abstractly using Hensel's lemma, but for Q2, you sort of have to get your hands a little bit dirty. Um, and you have to, you have to sort of play around with, you know, what can, um, um, yeah, you have to play around with the different possibilities for like five dimensional forms and four dimensional forms. And the key thing that you need to do is you need to essentially look at congruences instead of looking at congruences mod P, you need to look at congruences mod eight. Um, so if you want to prove something like every five dimensional form is isotropic, um, you need to look at congruences mod eight. And that's because any element of, of Z2 which is congruent to one mod eight is a square. So in fact, the squares in Z2 cross are exactly the elements which are congruent to one mod eight. So Z2 cross squared is exactly those X in Z2 with X congruent to one mod eight. Yeah, so, so sorry, so thanks for asking. Uh, so I, I'm not gonna try to give so in this lecture and, and in tomorrow's lecture, I, I think I would not try to give these proofs in general for a local field. Um, so it's actually, right. So it's, it's not too difficult to prove it if, if you have a local field, which is a finite extension of QP for P greater than two, more or less the same proofs over QP for P greater than two are gonna work. But it is gonna be a little bit tricky to prove these types of things completely directly if you have, a, if you have an arbitrary finite extension of Q2. And a lot of it is really subsumed under uh, under local class field uh, local class field theory, and all of this really sort of follows as a special case of somehow of local class field theory. Um, but for Q two, I think it's a good idea to actually check directly that every five dimensional form is isotropic, and you just sort of have to get your hands a little bit dirty by thinking about congruence classes mod eight and uh, and so forth. Okay, sorry. So there was a question. Um, yes, that's right. Any so. Right, no, so, right, sorry. So the key feature of any local field is that there's a unique uh, anisotropic four-dimensional form, any, any non-Archimedean uh, local field, um, right. So the U invariant is four and there's a, there's a unique example of an anisotropic four-dimensional form. Um, and in the case of Q2, you can write it down explicitly, it's, it's this particular form. Um, yeah, so, so I, I'm gonna put this on the problem set um, for today. Okay. So, sorry, so there's a question. Is it difficult? Right, I mean, I guess, so Hensel's lemma is still true. It's just that uh, when, you, when, you, when you have squares, then two is not a two-adic unit. So it's not true that anything congruent to one mod two is a square, you need to be congruent to one mod eight. Yeah. Okay, but so so just to go back, um, so so there is a description, there is a description of the VIT group of any of any um, non-Archimedean local field. So up to this filtration. So although you don't have this nice description as it's a direct sum of the VIT group of FP plus a direct VIT group of FP uh, when P is greater than two, you always have this finite filtration, and you always have that I cubed is equal to zero. And you always have that the associated graded terms are Z mod two E cross mod E cross squared and Z mod two. So, sorry, so just to recap, the VIT group of E, so E is a local field, has a filtration where the associated graded terms are W of E mod I is given by Z mod two I mod I squared is given by E cross mod E cross squared. Um, so for example, you work, I mean, I, I think in the exercises, maybe in Friday's exercises, there was the exercise of working what this is, 
explicitly when E is Q2. Um, and then I squared mod I cubed is equal to Z mod two. So you, you, don't have a you don't have a direct description as, as an abelian group of the Vit group of, of E as like a direct sum of, of two things, but you always have this, you always have this uh, sort of three-step filtration. Uh, yeah, sorry, question. So I was wondering, looking at the filtration, if we think mm -hmm. of it, if we think of all those things, not as, well, rings, but just as abelian groups, and we think of this as a, as a, actually as a normal, as a normal series. Well, in general, mm -hmm. this thing is not going to be a composition series, right? Because this E star modulo E star square isn't going to be simple. Is there any, like in the case of QP, for example, for P greater than two, we have uh, Z mod four Z. Is mm -hmm. there any interest in, well, extending this to, to a composition series? Like, is there any interest in treating this as a, as a normal series and extending it to a composition series? Is there any information in that? Sorry, what do you mean by the difference between a composition series and a normal series? Well, um, I mean, in this case, because all the groups are abelian, I guess that, well, subnormal and normal, they, they coincide in this case, right? So I, I'm, just, I'm just looking at this filtration and thinking of it as uh, basically a sequence of, of abelian groups and not just rings. And I'm wondering, well, this, this factor, this E star modulo E star squared, that doesn't have to be simple, but of course we can refine. If we look at it as a oh, series of abelian okay. groups, we can refine it to a composition series. Would there be any, any information hiding there? Like, is that something that's investigated so, in, in the bibliography? So at least if I understand your question, right, I think it's not gonna be very canonical because these are F2 vector spaces. So there are many different ways um, so, I mean, E cross mod E cross squared is gonna get quite large when E is like some big extension of Q2. Um, but so, so I think what, what really is, what, what one really wants to do is to understand the multiplication. So, so the thing is that like the exact, right? So I think, it's what, I think what you said might not be, the composition series is not necessarily gonna be very canonical, um, but what you do have, so that there is some extra structure here, which you do wanna understand. So, so this is right. So this is this is as an abelian. What I've described is 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 at the level of abelian groups, and so so i cubed is is zero. So so this is a sort of a complete sort of filtration as abelian groups. But but there is a little bit more information here that that you want to understand, which is the multiplication. So the multiplication, right? So there's a map from i mod i squared times i mod i squared into I squared mod I cubed, uh, which is also just I squared, which is Z mod two. Um, and so, right, so if you want to understand the, the VIT group, you want to understand some of the multiplication, um, it's, it's given by, well, you can try to understand it by looking at the multiplication on associated graded terms. Um, and so this is a pairing, which goes from E cross mod E cross squared times E cross mod E cross squared into uh, Z mod two, into plus or minus one, this, this multiplication law. And this turns out to be super, uh, actually sort of a fundamental importance and it's this thing called a Hilbert symbol. Uh, sorry, so question. Um, uh, sorry, that's a Z mod two. Not, not, yeah. Okay. Above, sorry, uh, above where? Yes, like uh, you have multiplication and e, oh, mod e squared, and then what's the other term of the product? So it's i mod i squared? Sorry, uh, okay. uh, you, you mean here? Yes. Yes, sorry, it's the same thing. It's i mod i squared. Thanks. Right. Okay, so, um, so, so, so there's a natural pairing that this gives you, and this pairing is actually sort of really fundamental for um, studying uh, quadratic forms over local fields. And it's, it's, it's this construction, which is called the Hilbert symbol, and it's sort of a general feature of local fields. So definition, let E be a local field. So given elements A comma B in E cross, 
we're going to define the Hilbert symbol. Uh, brackets a comma b to be the following. So it's plus one if z squared equals ax squared plus by squared has a non-trivial solution. So i.e. if brackets one minus a minus b is isotropic. And it's going to be minus one otherwise. So this is called the, the Hilbert symbol. And it's just a sign. So the Hilbert symbol is just a sign that you can associate to any elements of, uh, of E cross. All right, so, so for example, uh, right. so, so maybe let me list some, so I just have a few minutes left. So maybe let me just list some, some, some properties of the Hilbert symbol. So explicitly where this is coming from is that uh, the Hilbert symbol of A comma B, so sorry, since I've been talking about bit rings, is the following. Well, you form, you consider brackets one minus a, tensor brackets one minus b. And so this, this lives in the vit ring of E. So this, this lives in I and this lives in I. And when you multiply them, this lives in I squared and I squared is exactly Z mod two. And so the Hilbert symbol is exactly, is exactly the sign that you get out of this. Um, so brackets a comma b is equal to well you can say, you can equivalently say it this way, so it's it's one if the form uh, brackets one minus a minus b a b over e is hyperbolic, which well you can check this is so I'll put this on the on the homework that's the same as uh, brackets one minus a minus b being isotropic it's the same as this being hyperbolic. And it's minus one if uh, the form brackets one minus a minus b comma ab is anisotropic. And so recall that there's exactly one choice of anisotropic form of dimension four uh, over a local field. Um, okay. So, um, so, so, so if you have elements a and b in, your, in, in, in the group of units of your field E, um, you cook up either this three-dimensional quadratic form or this four-dimensional quadratic form. And then you ask whether it's, in the first case, whether it's isotropic or not, or in the second case, whether it's hyperbolic or not, sort of equivalent. Um, and then that, uh, that is encoding this, this construction called a Hilbert symbol. So the Hilbert symbol Uh, is, uh, right, okay, so yes. So there's a question, why, why does E need to be a local field? Why, why can't we do this just very generally? Um, right, so we can do this very generally, but it's not necessary. You, so you can make this at least a first definition or, or you can make either of these definitions very generally, but it's not going to be a very good definition for the following reason. So, um, Right, so let, let, let's, let's, write, let's write down some, some, some properties of the Hilbert symbol. So the Hilbert symbol is gonna satisfy various properties. Uh, so for example, the Hilbert symbol of A comma uh, one is always one uh, because, well, right. The Hilbert symbol of a comma one minus a is equal to one because you can always solve z squared equals a times one plus, well, because you can write one is equal to a times one plus one minus a times one. Um, a comma minus a is equal to one. So 
So you can write down a bunch of basic properties of the Hilbert symbol that do not use the fact that E is local and you can, you can make this definition. But what's actually kind of uh, sort of special about the case that E is local is that this is bilinear. And so it gives a bilinear pairing. It gives a symmetric bilinear pairing from E cross mod E cross squared times E cross mod E cross squared into Z mod two, into plus or minus one. Uh, and in fact, it's non-degenerate. Okay, so maybe this is where I, I should sort of I, I should sort of wrap up. Um, so 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 what's key about a local field? So I, I'm going to have to come back to this next time. What's really key about a local field and about this this construction of a Hil of of the Hilbert symbol is that by looking at whether or not you have a solution to this quadratic form, you get a bilinear pairing from e cross mod e cross squared with itself into z mod two. Um, and this bilinear pairing is actually non-degenerate. So I think, in, you know, I'm going to try to put this on the problem set, but this, so you can, you can try to work this out very explicitly for QP. And when P is greater than two, this is going to give you essentially the quadratic symbol or the Legendre symbol. Um, and for Q2, it's going to be a little bit more complicated. For Q2, of course, it's going to, you're going to have to sort of work out some congruences mod eight. Um, but, um, right, so, so I guess the main thing that I, you know, sort of wanted to explain is that you can think about this in terms of the vit ring. So, this Hilbert symbol is something that is encoded in the vit ring because it's exactly the map from i mod i squared times i, it's exactly the multiplication squared, the multiplication map from i mod i squared times i mod i squared into i squared mod i cubed, which is z mod two, and i mod i squared is e cross mod e cross squared, i mod i squared is e cross mod e cross squared, and this, this sort of multiplication law in the vit ring is exactly the Hilbert symbol. Okay, so sorry to end in a slightly awkward place, but yeah, so thanks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick this up tomorrow and say more about the Hilbert symbol. So, yeah, so I'll stick around for, for questions. Uh, is there, okay, can I ask a question? Yes, please. So uh, is there a reason why like uh, even dimensional, the idea of even dimensional forms is important and like not like dimension multiple of three? Oh, sorry. Oh, that's because, okay. No, no. You're modeling okay, up yeah, the yeah, that, form. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, right. mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. That's, that was obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Sorry, so the question, there's a question. Do we need E to be a local non-Archimedean field of characteristic not two to define the Hilbert symbol? So the Hilbert symbol, sorry. So I guess we need the characteristic not to be not two, um, but in fact, yeah, right. So you can define the Hilbert symbol over the real numbers as well. Um, so so this, this, this definition that I wrote up here of, uh, of the Hilbert symbol, it works over any, any local field of characteristic not two. And it's going to be it's going to have this bilinearity property. So right. So for example, you can define the Hilbert symbol over the real numbers, and then it's going to be minus one if and only if a and b are both negative. Um, if you're over the complex numbers, it's just going to be I mean c cross mod c cross squared is zero. So there's nothing there. But yeah. Right. So yeah. So that's yeah. That's a great question. I mean that's exactly the Sorry, so the question is, you know, what does this have to do with Galois cohomology? I mean, this is exactly the subject of the Milner conjectures, the theorem. Um, so, so in fact, the, 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 so I, I, will, I will try to try to tie this together next time, but um, since I'm not going to say much about Galois cohomology, in fact, what happens is that for any field, so maybe I can write this for any field. Uh, so, right, so for any field F, one considers uh, this iadic filtration. One considers the vit ring of F, and one considers this iadic filtration. 
And uh, so, in fact, the, I guess the Milner conjecture, so a theorem of, in this case, Orlov, uh, Rizhik, and Rivatsky, is that uh, if you take this associated graded ring, so of the Witt ring, so this is the direct sum of i mod i to the n mod i to the n plus one, then this is isomorphic on the one hand to, to Milner k theory mod two, which is what I would talk about tomorrow, and also to the Galois cohomology uh, of, uh, of the field F with coefficients in, yeah, C mod two. So in fact, it's exactly, exactly that. Well, I guess that's, so there, there are actually two Milner conjectures and I think that this, the relation with Galba cohomology was the, um, uh, was, yeah, it was proved by Vygotsky. And maybe I think it was proved first. Right, sorry. So the question is, um, right. So how do we extract information about a ring using knowledge about its filtration? Um, right, I mean, I guess it's an example you would give in an algebra class. Um, I don't know, I mean, right. So if, if you have a, I mean, if you have a filtration on the ring, it doesn't quite determine, um, it does, if you know the associated graded ring, it doesn't quite determine the ring. But I mean, for example, it, it will tell you, I mean, it will tell you how to compute a product modulo terms of higher filtration. So I, I don't know if I have a great answer. I don't know if I have a great answer to that question. Um, I mean, sometimes, Right, I mean, so for example, if, if you know, if, if you wanna show that a product is non-zero, then if the product is non-zero and the associate greater then it's non-zero in the, in the ring to start with. But for example, it's, it's gonna be hard if you just know the associate grade, it's gonna be hard to tell whether something actually is zero to prove that something is zero because the associate graded is gonna let you prove that something is zero modulo higher filtration. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll I'll see you see you tomorrow or at the office hours.